about their children's book. They're, they are selling their children's book, Death is Wrong, in the back there. I think it's a fabulous idea. I have two children myself. I tell them all the time that they're not going to die, and they have to take my frozen head out of the freezer at a certain point. <laughs> and it kind of creeps them out. I said it's either that or I turn into a robot. And so they really, they don't like either option. Okay, here they are, Wendy and Jenny. Thank you, Hank, and thank you, everyone, for attending. My name is Gennady Stolirov, or for those of you who speak Russian, Gennady Stolirov, and... I'm Wendy Stolirov. Oh, sorry. There we go. They ran out of a little uh, fancy microphone, so i got to use this one. I'm Wendy Stolirov. I'm the illustrator and Gennady's wife. Yes, so Death is Wrong is our illustrated children's book on indefinite human life extension. Today we'd like to talk to you about what motivated us to write this book, what our hopes for this book are, and some exciting ongoing developments with regard to spreading this book to children. So if we could get the next slide, I'd ask you to imagine the year 2045, commonly posited as the year of the technological singularity. And I'd like to ask you the question, what should we fear about the year 2045? Even in transhumanist circles in recent years, there has been a lot of discussion of existential risk, technologies that can go rogue and destroy us all, like uh, rogue AI or the gray goo scenario of nanotechnology. Is that what we should be afraid of? And I would argue no. Rather, what we should be afraid of is stagnation. We should be afraid of the typical day in 2045 being much like the typical day in 2013 when we wrote this book, except farther along the trajectory of decay. So in the year 2045, Wendy and I will be 58 years old, and what I'm worried about is I will wake up on a typical morning, have my morning mug of coffee, much like I do these days, and I will stare into that mug of coffee and wonder what happened to that singularity that we were promised? Why isn't it here yet? What happened to all the hopes for accelerating technological progress, transforming our lives? Will we at age 58 and people like us be seen as quixotic dreamers, fantasizing about a future that never was? Will kids these days, the next generation of young people, not care about advancing technological progress or promoting indefinite life extension, either because they don't understand the feasibility or desirability of it, or because their lives are preoccupied with just survival from one day to the next? Will Luddism and change aversion prevail? Will people who don't want to unleash these technologies take control of the institutions that have the power to regulate progress away? And if we could go to the next slide, I'll tell you what we could do about it. At age five, I promised that I would devote my life to the struggle against senescence and death. This is one of the beautiful illustrations from our book of the botanical gardens in the city of Minsk, capital of Belarus, where I was born. And one spring morning in 1993, I was there with my grandmother, just enjoying the sights. It was a beautiful, warm, sunny morning. There was a plethora of life. So many plants were in bloom, there were so many different animals, there was such a richness of color that I can still remember it very vividly. And the thought occurred to me, what a travesty it would be for all of this to just disappear, for not even a memory of it to remain, for an entire individual universe to be snuffed out irreversibly. But what could I do? I'm not a doctor, I'm not a biologist, I can't perform research on life extension directly. And I've been thinking about this for years. What is a unique contribution that I could make to materially improve the likelihood that we will reach indefinite longevity in our lifetimes? Well, I'm lucky. I happen to be married to the best illustrator I know. And I think I can use ideas and advance ideas to a new demographic in an effort to change the world. And if we could move on to the next slide, I'll tell you about why death is wrong is so important. It fills an important void. Because we as adults can have access to literature on a virtually daily basis with regard to scientific and technological breakthroughs, with regard to the philosophy of transhumanism, with regard to arguments for the feasibility and desirability of a definite life extension. Not so for children. Even though virtually everyone learns about death as a child, 
And the first reaction is typically one of bewilderment, horror, outrage, fear. And yet, almost immediately, children are met with comforting excuses, evasions, and rationalizations about why death might not be so bad after all, or even somehow justifiable, or it's inevitable, but it's far away, so get it out of your mind, don't worry about it, go on living day to day. We wanted an antidote to that. We wanted children to have a resource to understand that their initial outrage at death is perfectly justified and should be used as a motivator to help advance indefinite life extension. Kids. So what does this book offer? It starts with a bit of autobiography about me as a child growing up in Belarus, then moving to the United States, finding out about death, assembling the knowledge that I now have with regard to the fact that indefinite longevity is feasible and desirable. We offer some examples of beautiful illustrations of long-lived creatures, including the Turritopsis nutricula jellyfish, the giant tortoise. We also have an image of the Methuselah tree, one of the longest living trees in existence in this very state of California. We offer child-friendly summaries of key scientific breakthroughs, as well as Dr. Aubrey de Grey's SENS program, that's Strategies for Engineered Negligible Senescence. We offer child-friendly philosophical arguments for life extension and rebuttals to common tropes like the overpopulation argument, the boredom argument, the argument that you need to do away with the old to make room for the new as if people were yesterday's trash. We offer some ideas of what a person could do with an indefinite lifespan, projects, opportunities, discoveries that are just not accessible to us with the current lengths of lifespans that we are facing. For instance, interstellar space travel, or becoming very, very wealthy on a modest rate of compound interest. <laughs> we also offer quotations from five great pro-longevity thinkers throughout history, as well as some beautiful portraits by Wendy. These five thinkers are Francis Bacon, Benjamin Franklin, the Marquis de Condorcet, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Alan Harrington. If we could move on, uh, the key message that I want to convey to you today is we need a new abolitionism. One of my favorite quotations comes from William Lloyd Garrison, the great 19th century anti-slavery activist who said, urge immediate abolition as earnestly as we may. It will, alas, be gradual abolition in the end. We have never said that slavery would be overthrown by a single blow, that it ought to be. We shall always contend. And I will contend that no truer words were ever spoken when it comes to the abolition of the death of innocent humans. If the entire world were to embrace this cause tomorrow, it would still take decades of scientific breakthroughs in order to make it happen for us. However, we need to want it to happen yesterday. We need to want it to happen 5,000 years ago, because it's only with that attitude that we can gather enough resources enough support and eliminate enough barriers, institutional, cultural, philosophical barriers that people might otherwise put in our way. If we could move on, we need to raise a new generation of activists. Even a handful of precocious children committed to the prospects of indefinite life extension from an early age could make the difference between us surviving indefinitely and being part of the last generations to die. So you can see I'm not just doing it for the children, I am doing it for us. I am doing it for everyone in this audience of every generation because I believe we each have precious individual universes that deserve and indeed demand preservation. So I urge you to spread the word to libraries, schools, bookstores, children's activity groups, wherever children may be found, so that we can unleash these potential young cosmic revolutionaries. As Alan Harrington put it, we must remember that we are cosmic revolutionaries, not stooges conscripted to advance the natural order that kills everybody. And if we could move on, I'll tell you how to obtain it. You can obtain it on Amazon or on CreateSpace in the paperback version, or at this very conference where we're selling it for $6, which is the lowest price you'll find anywhere, especially for an autographed copy. There's also a Kindle version for 99 cents on Amazon. That's a great read for adults. For children who often will not have unfettered access to electronic devices, the paperback version would probably be a better bet. This book has received some excellent reviews. B.J. Murphy of the Proactionary Transhumanist said this is the book he wishes he'd have read as a child. 
Zoltan Istvan, best-selling author of The Transhumanist Wager, who will be here later today, said, this book is well-written, well-illustrated, and a fantastic read. And Professor Charles M. Steele said, I recommend this one without reservation. It's worth reading. And actually, earlier this week, there was an article on Fast Company about this book, where the reviewer essentially said that this is not just a great book for children, it will also strike deep philosophical chords in adults. So this is a book for everybody, really. And I'm even more excited about the next slide because just one week ago, we initiated an Indiegogo fundraiser titled Help Teach 1,000 Kids That Death Is Wrong. This is a fundraiser in conjunction with MILE, the Movement for Indefinite Life Extension. It's an idea that won the MILE Activist Contest in January, so we decided to implement it. The goal is to raise $5,000 to distribute 1,000 copies of Death is Wrong to longevity activists throughout the country for distribution to children in their local areas. These are people who are aware, perhaps, of some promising recipients of this book. The book would be given to children free of charge, so one condition of receiving the books paid for through this fundraiser is the activists may not resell them. We, as the authors, can order highly discounted copies from CreateSpace, ship them to the activists directly for distribution, and we are setting this up as a flexible fund uh, funding campaign, which means no matter how much money we raise, all of it will be spent on getting copies of this book out to children. I'm pleased to announce we're already 12.6% of the way to our goal. We've raised $630 so far in just the first week. And I'm even more pleased to announce the first shipment of 11 books has actually been sent out just a few days ago. So this is happening. It's happening right now. And we would really welcome all of your support. Thank you so much for all of you who have contributed already. The deadline to contribute is April 23rd, 2014. So there's a bit of time, but you know how quickly time passes. That's why we're here. So I urge you all to contribute today. And, and that concludes my remarks. I'll let Wendy say a few words about her art and what inspired her to create the beautiful illustrations in this book. Thank you. My presentation is going to be quite a bit shorter than yours. Uh, just a few <laughs> remarks. But uh, Janati and I worked intimately on the creation of both the text and the illustrations. He took the lead on the text, and I took the lead on the illustrations. But everything was a mutual brainstorm. Uh, we, and I think I need to move away from your microphone a little bit. There we go. Uh, uh, we talked about a whole bunch of different creatures that don't senesce, but we settled on Turritopsis natricula, uh, the Methuselah tree, the uh, giant Galapagos tortoise, and various other animals that uh, come across very well to children. Uh, I think that uh, there are some animals like the lobster, for example, that are a little less cute, uh, perhaps a little less child-friendly, uh, but they're all digitally hand-painted. I used graphics tablet and special digital painting software to create the images. Uh, and it was really a delight working with you, Janati. You're an excellent client. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but this is a fantastic opportunity, especially for those of you who don't have children of your own or don't personally know any children. This is a great way to get the book into a child's hands, even if you don't know one yourself. So uh, if you have any questions about the creation of the book or our reasons or anything at all, we'd be happy to take them. I think we have about three and a half minutes left. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> We're at 12 and a half minutes. Yeah, so two and a half minutes. Two and a half minutes. Yes, question here. So uh, what, we go, we t go to Google and type Indiegogo death is wrong? Uh, Janati's business cards at the back there have the URL on them. If you come by our table, you can pick up a business card and it has the web address on it. And the title of the fundraiser on Indiegogo.com is Help Teach 1,000 Kids That Death is Wrong. So you'll be able to find it like that. If you Google Death is Wrong children's book, uh, you would get it as one of the yeah, results Yeah, it'll come well. up. Any other questions? All right. All right. Well, thank you all thank so much. Thank you very much. much.